I'm excited to announce a new series that I'll be doing on Alchemy Unveiled, which is a book by Johannes Helmond, a Rosicrucian initiate. And according to him, this is the first time the secret of the Philosopher's Stone is being openly explained by him. This will be a lot of fun, uncovering the secrets of uh, the Philosopher's Stone and of alchemy in general. We will obviously look at some more symbolism and breaking down its meanings and, and so on. So let's dive into it. Just a few decades ago, people used to think that alchemy was nothing more than medieval superstition. But things have changed since then. Scientists have made significant progress with atomic fission, which has allowed them to transform elements. This has opened up the possibility of alchemy actually working, at least in theory. Nowadays, psychology has started to embrace alchemy and has come to understand that it's more about transforming oneself internally rather than physically transmuting substances. However, it is important to note that modern psychology, particularly represented by Carl Gustav Jung, hasn't fully grasped the core essence of alchemy. Jung sees alchemy purely as a psychological process, considering it as a form of personal development called individuation, which involves integrating unconscious contents, but alchemy encompasses much more than that. Jung and his colleagues overlooked the profound realism inherent in alchemy, which is closely linked to the inner body, or corpus subtile, of a human being. Jung tends to view this as a purely psychological collective unconscious. Although the substantiality of this corpus sideribus, named by Paracelsus, cannot be easily dismissed upon closer examination, when it comes to alchemy, it's not just a psychoanalytic process or a simple quest for turning lead into gold, as many assume. The lead that alchemists aim to transform into gold is not the chemical element, PB or lead, known to common chemists, but rather the metaphorical dark Saturnus of the Hermetic philosophers. Similarly, the celestial or heavenly body they refer to is not an external entity but an inner astral principle present throughout the material world. In the realm of alchemy, we're not dealing with the grand processes of the external world. Instead, we're delving into the mysterious and intricate microcosmic processes that have been the focus of ancient wisdom for ages. It is safe to say that hermetic sciences are among the oldest known to humankind. These sciences likely originated from a tradition that even the ancient Egyptians revered, considering them as secrets of primeval times. The Greeks and Israelites inherited these mysteries from the Egyptians and carefully guarded them, particularly through the schools of the prophets, which disappeared during the Babylonian captivity. Eventually, the ancient Hermetic tradition resurfaced within original Christianity and was continued by the early disciples and apostles as the Disciplina Arcani, which can be translated to the secret training. This Hermetic science also made its way to the new Platonists and Arabian philosophers through the original Christian Nazarenes, eventually reaching Europe during the Middle Ages. As a result of these developments, various hermetic centers were established throughout Europe. One notable example is the formation of the Order of the Golden Fleece in 1429. From this order emerged the Rosicrucians, who initially maintained a secretive presence rather than being public. It wasn't until after the Thirty Year War that the Rosicrucians began to establish stronger connections with the outside world particularly through the manifestation of the Hermetic Gold and Rosicrucianism in 1710. The tradition carried forward consciously only by our order. In our current times, there are numerous writings on alchemy that bear its name. These writings often come from various sources and are presented with an enticing allure. 
However, many of these texts have been misused, containing absurd theories that have led astray those who seek understanding. Our enlightened order aims to correct these false doctrines by publishing these treaties. Our intention is not to reveal all the secrets of alchemy and expose them to the general public's curiosity, speculation, and skepticism. Instead, our purpose is to guide the few sincere seekers of hidden wisdom in the right direction to discover the great elixir. These seekers will have a measuring stick, a standard that will help them discern between the writings of genuine hermetic adepts and fanciful speculations of dreamers and charlatans. Any sincere seeker or student of the hermetic sciences who is genuinely called upon will undoubtedly sooner or later come into contact with our illuminated order. They will receive further information and guidance that goes beyond what is contained in these writings before you. The main purpose and finis ultimus of the hermetic art is not to produce gold as it is believed of the ill-informed lovers of gold, but instead the study of God's beautiful miracles, which lie hidden in the obstruse rerum centro, and to contemplate the sacrarium naturae benedictae, eusque majestatem occultum remoto velo. And the last part can be translated as the Shrine of Blessed Nature and Her Majesty hidden behind a veil. It is widely recognized that the alchemists have been using a secret code since ancient times, accessible only to those who have been initiated. That's why Herman Fichted stated that only the genuine adepts can comprehend the writings of the true hermetics. In reality, it is impossible for outsiders to decipher the hidden meanings in the ancient writings of the adepts. Many have been misled by their insatiable desire for gold or the extraordinary powers of the life elixirs. They conducted blind experiments only to face a great loss and disappointments. Without a proper understanding of the correct theory, one will hardly make progress in the actual practice of the Philosopher's Stone. Moreover, without knowing what one is seeking, they won't recognize it when they find it. True alchemy is, in essence, a mystical art that demands patient examination of authentic hermetic writings and a deep study of nature. It also requires revelation either through an initiated adept or an inner divine illumination. The style of the genuine adept's writings have always been obscure and filled with parables, particularly when expressing the hermetic art through allegorical figures and puzzles. It is these instances that they communicate most clearly while concealing the art when everything seems to be straightforward. This is done to keep unsuitable individuals away from the hermetic art from the outset, preventing any misuse. If the initiates were to reveal all the mysteries of alchemy indiscriminately, the ignorant will disrespect the art for not understanding it and those who do understand it would find it too easy. However, when the deeper truth is veiled in allegory, it remains safeguarded from disrespect and provides diligent seekers with the motivation to philosophize. In some cases, this mystical veil can be taken to an extreme, making it challenging for even sincere seekers to explore the allegories. Therefore, it is of utmost importance to inform those who genuinely strive about the true essence of the Philosopher's Stone and the key to the language of Hermetic art in order to prevent them from being completely misled. One who comprehends the genuine Hermetic will gradually learn to understand all true adepts. To offer well-intentioned advice to sincere seekers of wisdom, these writings aim to partially unveil the secrecy that the ancient adepts have shrouded over the hermetic art. However, this unveiling is only done in accordance with the unwritten laws of the mysteries, ensuring that genuine truth seekers do not stray from the correct path towards the Philosopher's Stone. Simultaneously, by maintaining this veil, 
the deceptive gold makers and misguided tincture cooks who have exploited the name of alchemy will be exposed and rendered entirely nonsensical. In the microcosmic prologue of 1720, the following is stated about these pseudo-chemists. The unworthy lovers and seekers, with their perverse and unnatural subjectis in laboribus, cannot bring the philosophical sun and moon child into the world. They seek this divine natural art without recognition of God and nature. They do not even know what kind of thing nature is, and they know not the inner workings of nature. Their minds go consistently around the circumference and they speak of many effects of nature, but they do not find the center of nature, which causes all of the effects of nature. They should draw out of the living fire, out of the living metal of the sages, the seed, consequently making the mercury through the mercury, or make the first materia through the first materia. They do not know what the life and the seed of metals is, nor do they know what mercury and the first materia are. And the first materia is of course the prima materia or materia prima that we find in alchemy. Instead, they work in dead and deceased subjectis, such as common gold, silver, and mercury. And they also do this with wood, coal, lamps, or some kind of deadly fire. Being of the opinion that through this, they will prepare a life-giving and life-extending universal remedy and tincture. As if life and death were in their hands, they operate with nothing but bodies, whereas nature deals with nothing but spermatic things. They seek an easy art and heavy labor, but instead it is a difficult art and easy labor. They spend great amounts of money for materials which can be had for nothing. They cannot be bought in a store or apothecary. They must be taken directly out of nature. And this was quoted from the microcosmic prologue from uh, 1720. It is impossible that any mortal understands this art unless he has been previously enlightened by the divine light. This is from Dornius Theatrum Chemicum 1602. The terminology used by the ancient spiritual adepts can be bewildering maze for those who are not well versed in the principles of hermetic sciences. To acquire such knowledge, one must dedicate many years, if not decades, to studying the old classical writings of the adepts. Moreover, a higher level of enlightenment or guidance from a true master of the art is necessary before truly mastering the theory of hermetic sciences. Without this foundation, one should not dare to venture into the practice of the hermetic art. This is precisely why the microcosmic prologue states the following. Understanding the writings of the sages is akin to understanding and interpreting the Bible. Anyone who wishes to comprehend both must seek the spirit and the light from God, from which they are written and in which they reside. They must possess the light that illuminated the sages, otherwise they would judge these writings as a blind person would judge colors. Alas, those who write not from the fountain of nature but rather from the processes of compiled philosophical books are deceivers. They mix truth with error to blind both the reader and the innocent seeker of pure light. However, those who have a thorough understanding of the subject can clearly distinguish truth from lies in all books. The pure spirit of nature reveals more to them than they can put into writing. Microcosmic Prologue 1720 The initiated often faces great difficulty in navigating the numerous meanings attributed to individual alchemical symbols and their synonyms. One source of confusion is the concept of mercury, where one must precisely understand the distinction between the common philosophical mercury, Mercurius Universalis, and the mercury of the philosophers, Mercurius Philosophorum. Similarly, one should not mistake the simple Mercurius Corporeus for double mercury, Mercurius Duplicatus. Moreover, the alchemists were aware of variations like white and red mercury, fleeting and fixed mercury, 
and even instances where mercury could be considered as sulfur or salt. Only those truly knowledgeable possess the ability to discern specific marks or signs that indicate which form of mercury is being referred to in the ancient writings of the adepts. It is not surprising, then, that renowned researchers like Swiss psychologist Carl Gustav Jung struggles with the multitude of alchemical mercurial symbols as he did not possess the key to the old hermetic symbolic language. Without this key, alchemy remains an enigmatic puzzle. The hermetics were familiar with various kinds of sulfur and salt alongside the enigmatic mercury. They recognize at least three different types of gold, four types of fire, three types of water, several types of earth, and three different materials for the great work. It is crucial for the initiate to learn how to distinguish and differentiate between them. The complexity of this multiplicity may discourage some enthusiasts of the Hermetic Mysteries. However, those who genuinely seek truth will not be deterred by the challenges of exploration as the rewards for such a quest are truly significant. Therefore, it is essential to fully grasp the theory of the Hermetic Sciences before embarking on the alchemical practice. One must possess a comprehensive understanding of the ancient writings of the adepts and have a profound insight into the subject matter itself. Above all, thorough knowledge of the hermetic theory of the elements is absolutely indispensable as it forms the foundation of all alchemical contemplations. As Eugenius Philaletha expressed, to understand the workings of the great art, one must first acquire a profound knowledge of the theory of the elements, for they are the pillars upon which the whole edifice of alchemy is built. The four elements of alchemy, namely fire, air, water and earth, hold different meanings within the context of alchemical philosophy. They should not be confused with their conventional interpretations. The earth referred to by the alchemists is not the ordinary soil we tread upon, but rather the pure essence of earth, the central fixed natrium. This natrium contains the nature sulfur, which plays a vital role in coagulation of mercury. Similarly, when the hermetics speak of their water, they are also not referring to the H2O of conventional chemistry. Instead, they speak of the water of the sages, a symbolic representation in which they perform their operations. It is in this water that they cook their fire, symbolizing the transformation of their sulfur. It is important to know that while conventional chemists use fire to heat their water and materials, the hermetic sages reverse the process. They utilize their water to cook their fire, signifying a unique approach and understanding of the alchemical processes. Everybody knows how to cook water in the fire, however, if they would know how to cook our fire in our water, then their knowledge of nature would raise above that of the cooks. Combure in agua, lava in igne, which means burn in water, wash in fire, is a well-known saying among alchemists. It may sound contradictory, but wisdom often carries paradoxical truths. The concept of air in alchemy differs significantly from the air we commonly breathe. It represents a fleeting substance called salt nitre, which is like an airy salt. It is a vaporous and mercurial moist essence that rises from the earth when it is driven by an inner central fire. This moist vapor combines with a dry, fiery and sulfuric mist in the upper regions. Under the influence of thunder and lightning, these elements unite and form a peculiar salt-water mixture often referred to as chaos, seed or materia prima. This unique substance then descends back to earth, where it undergoes a process of coagulation. It transforms into a double vitriolic salt or an earthly salt nitri that exhibits both white and red qualities within its core, symbolizing the presence of the sun, soul, and the moon, luna. 
Though it may seem perplexing, this phrase in description represents the alchemical journey filled with paradoxes. It signifies the need for transformation through unconventional means and the integration of seemingly opposing forces. Alchemy teaches us that the wisdom often resides in embracing the complexities and contradictions of life. That is why the Hermetic philosophers say that their materia is being born like the thunder and leaves behind similar signs. The materia of the alchemists can be categorized into three distinct forms. The first and most remote is known as the materia remotissima. It represents a mist of the elements, a primordial cloud of darkness, or the metaphorical water of the depths. It is associated with the divine spirit that moved above it in the beginning, the Ark Chaos or the Kabbalistic Ainsof. The second form, called Materia Remota Vel Secunda, is considered in nature and contains within it the hidden Materia Proxima. It is like a vessel that encapsulates the essence of the next stage. The third and final form is referred to as the Materia Tersha. It encompasses the specific beings found in the three kingdoms of existence, minerals, vegetation, and animals. It represents the diverse manifestation of life in the world. So yes, this sounds like the three veils of negative existence from Kabbalah, which is very interesting. So the first materia, the Mercurius of alchemists, is the universal spirit, the seed of the world and is also known as the Materia Prima Universalis. The second Materia, Materia Secunda, corresponds to our imperfect subject, a microcosmic reflection of the original dark chaos. It can be likened to the immature mineral electrum referred to as Magnesia by alchemists. It is also known as the Antimonium, meaning all in all, according to Basilius Valentinus. This material is associated with lead, symbolizing the Saturn of the Sages. It represents coagulated celestial dew, the essence of the moon, a forsaken land, an earthly cavern, the vineyard of the Sages, and the wingless dragon. Within the second materia, the materia proxima, lies the true and essential subject of alchemy. It is known as the central salt of the sages and fixed grain, the virgin earth or the secret salt nitri. It is also referred to as the smaragdin salt, sol saturni, sal tartari. This substance is considered the earthly foundation from which Adam's paradisiacal body was formed, immortal and incorruptible. Alchemists consider it their genuine and authentic subject, also known as the root moisture or the radical moisture. It is a twofold sulfuric salt, representing both the male and female aspects akin to the hermaphrodite or proteus, the chameleon of the sages, their green lion, premature gold or fixed sulfur, white on the outside and red within. It is as a fountain of sulfuric gold, a virgin mermaid or heavenly nymph, and is encompassed in the concept of the solar and lunar body, constituting the greatest secret of alchemy. The term hermaphroditic is used because this central salt possesses a dual nature, transient and fixed, male and female. The transient part represents Mercury, while the fixed part comprises Sol and Luna so the sun and moon, meaning the red and white sulfur. These two sulfurs are the basis of the two tinctures, the red and white tinctures. Consequently, it is also referred to as the sal rebis, the salt with the three principles, mercury, sulfur, and salt, all united within. The red sulfur found within the salt symbolizes the central fire, the subterranean central sun, or the seed of God. It is also known as the king or the man. 
On the other hand, Mercurius represents the water of the metals and is associated with the seed of silver, embodying the feminine aspect often referred to as the woman. In our virgin earth, the elements of fire and water, sulfur and mercury, exist in a state where they were somewhat connected but can also be easily separated. This characteristic allows them to be reunited in marvelous ways. The process of separation and reduction is essential to transform imperfection into perfection. While nature creates these hermaphrodites, it leaves them in an imperfect state. However, when nature reaches its limits, the art of alchemy begins. Alchemy is the art that takes over where nature left off, aiming to perfect and refine these elemental substances. Because of this, it is only right that somebody makes haste with the materia and the key until and before the whole world enters into error and the pious themselves abandon hope. This was all for this first part of our journey into unveiling alchemy. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope that you learned something. Thank you for stopping by. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you guys in the next one.